the cave. All day long in the forge shop, the drop hammers fell a full two stories to mash the red-hot metal bars into the molds. We could hear them in our house a mile away. There were no ear protectors then. There was no OSHA. There was a plant safety man who gave it no thought. Day by day, year by year, the men went deafer and deafer. By the time they retired, their world must have been as quiet as the cave we visited when I was 12. No one spoke as we descended into dripping chambers, each cooler than the last, but even in that silence I could carry a little music with me, as if my mind was a jukebox and my memory a pocket heavy with quarters. We ended in a wide, round room, floodlit from every direction, filled with stalactites and stalagmites. It was like standing inside a huge marble pipe organ the moment before hands fell to the keys. You've never been in darkness like this, the guide said. And then she hit a switch to suspend us in unimaginable black. I searched myself in panic and couldn't find an image anywhere. Lord, save my eyes, I said to myself, as much as to any god who might descend so low. It was just a glimmer then, but now I know the whole and bitter truth. Without vision, I would not, like Milton, sit by the fire in the cavernous dark and build a book of angels. I would rather leave through someone's, anyone's photo album, the trip to the Rockies, Uncle Ed in his cups at the family reunion, than listen to the teachings of the mystics. Always it has been for me, the seen, high, high above the unseen world. One time I was out riding my bike and I saw a friend of mine who's a playwright. He had a dog named Stella name for a streetcar named Desire, a big Malamute. And he was thrashing around doing something with this dog. And as I got closer, I saw the dog had a squirrel that had been flattened over a period of months into this dried dove object. So when I got home, I sent him an email saying, don't you know that those dried squirrels are the sacramental wafer of the large breed dog apostolic <laughs> church? <laughs> And I thought, well, hell, I'm not going to waste that on an email. I can move it in a poem. <laughs> so I started, I started out to write about roadkill. A possum comes into it, too. And about two-thirds of the way through the poem, this boy enters the poem. And I, did, I, had, you know, I didn't sit down to write about that, but he came into the poem through my memory. It was a natural incident. And... Sometimes people are interested in process. Well, that's what the process is. Sometimes you don't know where the poem's going, you know, and then something comes up and you think, oh, this is a whole different poem. I'm going to run with this. Uh, I've still got the other part, but... It has an epigraph from a poem by an erstwhile California poet, Robinson Jeffers. Uh, it was a poem called Hurt Hawk. And in the poem he says, I'd sooner except the penalties, kill a man than a hawk. The squirrels are up to their nuts and pecans, and the largesse of the trees has made them careless in their comings and goings, their carryings and buryings. Every few blocks there's one who zigged just when he should have zagged. Car compacted, Sometimes their pink lungs pop out of their mouths, so it looks like they've been blowing bubblegum. After a few more days of crushings, they have been transubstantiated into the sacramental wafers of the large breed dog, Apostolic Church. I joke in the way we must joke about death, or wear the rictus of the dead ourselves. But I'm sad for the squirrels. Sad, too, for the possum lying by the streetside oleanders for three days now. Its size startles, big as a cat and heavy-bodied. 
It startles too because usually they don't get hit. They'll turn toward the oncoming car, their eyes will light up like phosphorus, and the car will break, unless the driver doesn't care, which must have happened here. The eyes on the first day were deep black discs that made me think it must still be alive, and there seemed to be little muscle ticks around the mouth, but I couldn't bear to prod it with my toe. If it was alive, I'd have to do something, and I had nothing near a plan. So I stared until I was sure it was still. It has taken these three days for the eyes to close. Or perhaps it's swelling that has made them seem to close. I've been taken to task and more than once for dwelling like this on animal death. But let me tell you a little story, a little human story. I'm going back 36 years to a night after 10, and it may even have been a night of this month because I remember sycamore leaves sidling like crabs on the street. I was walking my dog, and there was the tremolo of a screech owl, and then suddenly a terrible sound, like a cat screaming in heat, broke into the tremolo, and both the dog and I bristled because both of us knew it was not a cat sound but a human one. Around the corner we found a boy, three or four years old, in his pajamas, howling in panic, a long way from speech. I took his hand and led him to each of the houses that were lit. That long ago, people answered their doors even at night. And finally we found a woman who knew who he was. His mother was a cocktail waitress, who started her shift an hour after the father came home from his shift at the box factory. Her taillights would barely disappear before he took off for his night of drinking, leaving the boy with his eight-year-old sister. I didn't know if he had left the house awake or had sleepwalked his way out. The neighbor called the police, who took him home to the frightened sister Cops at the door, what a thing for a kid to waken to. That boy would be a middle-aged man now. I often wonder what became of him. Has he gone passive, alone in the dark, with a needle in his arm? Is he scratching his pimply ass in jail, harm for doing harm? It's easy to see him like that, hard to imagine him as an orthopedic surgeon, or a sports writer, or a nouvelle cuisine chef. If you lie long enough in misery, you don't rise from it. You make more misery to match it, and even more to surpass it, and then it becomes a career. Tell me, when's the last time you saw a baby squirrel? See what I'm getting at? Until they're they're kept in the nest until they're grown enough to outrun a dog. Cars, of course, remain the lightning bolt, the hand of God, the mystery beyond mystery, against which there is no defense.